My name is Tony Glynn and I've needed to use mental health services for many, many years. And I was just wondering, what do you think of our national health service here in this country? What do I think about the national health service itself? I wasn't prepared for that <laughs> in Bristol. <laughs> it's a perfectly good question. <laughs> Why are you asking? Well, the reason I'm asking is because didn't you say that the only therapeutic relationship was between a private therapist? I didn't say private. I didn't use it. Yeah. Of well, but, okay. And, um, and a paying somebody who pays. No, no, I didn't. I didn't, uh, if I said that, I want to withdraw it. No, 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 the uh, public health, the state has a role to play, just like there's a role to play in crime prevention or crime punishment or property protection. The state has, I mean, in this respect, I'm just quoting John Locke or any other classic English philosopher, legal philosopher, the, du the, duty of the, the, the core duty of the state, of the government, is to protect everyone's life, liberty, and property. That's John Locke. Now, the American Constitution, because of slavery, they changed property to the pursuit of happiness. Again, that was a purely li linguistic game. If you don't know American history, then you don't appreciate this. See, uh, the Declaration of Independence says every, we are all created equal. Of course, they had slaves. And of course, women had no vote, but you know, they were all created equal. It sounds good anyway. It's a nice, good, good idea. I mean, it's a, it was an idea. And we all have the divine right, so to speak. They didn't use the word divine, but they implied it higher, right? Not, not, it's not given to you by the state. You have this right to life, liberty, which means the state doesn't have a right to take away your life or your liberty. That answers your question about why can't you lock up someone who, who is crazy? Well, because you have a life to liberty. So you have to circumvent that. That's why it's a category. And then they couldn't say property because that would have meant validating slavery. So they changed it to the pursuit of happiness. So back to your question. The National Health Service is a service which is perfectly analogous, which exists in America, has existed for, for a very long time, called the Veterans Administration. Now, if you are a veteran in any kind of war, of course, there have been so many of them in the last 50 years in America. If you are a veteran, you have a right to get any and all kinds of health care at the Veterans Administration and drugs. Free of, free of charge, for as long as you live. What if you're not a veteran? No, no, let me f finish the veterans part. Now, I'm a veteran. Most, most men are veterans. But I wouldn't go there if my life depended on it, because I can afford not to go there. It's the same as if you want to get a letter to Birmingham from Syracuse or America very quickly, very securely. You send it by UPS or FedEx. You don't use the post office. You get a service from the state but it's likely not to be not as good as a private service. And don't blame this on me, this is a fact of life. This is called capitalism. Because the incentives are better, it works better. So this is, so the National Health Service, I know lots of people in England, and most of them whom I know don't use the National Health Service. So this again points up the fact that we are unequal. Well, I, I was just wondering, Doctor, if I was in your country and I... You would get perfectly good medical care. I would do. As a tourist, perfectly good. Right. <laughs> because look, look, I am old enough, I lived through this. There was no such thing as Medicare, Medicaid. This is, this is all came in after I was 50 years old. When I went to medical school, you either paid for a service or you got what was called charity care. Now, if you listened to well-trained doctors at that time, they would say, perhaps paternalistically, perhaps somewhat self-centeredly, 
that you know the charity patients at the university hospital, the penniless charity patients, get much better care than the average stupid rich person in the city who will go to a quack. Because this charity patient will be treated by the best doctors, free of charge, in order to be called a professor. Now that was the charity system. Sick people didn't die on the streets in 1940s either. I mean, you know, I, I went to med study medical school before the war. You know, I'm antique. But the system worked perfectly well then, too. And the reason why this essentially nationalized system came into America is just not called that we have a nationalized system, by, by and large, or very, very largely. Certainly, certainly, I have one. Anyone over 65 is on Medicare. So that's a nationalized system, except you have a choice to who to go to. And then that depends on the same factors that you raised already. What do you know? Which group do you go to? Because you have a choice then, and you, but you don't pay the bill. So this, this works. I have nothing against NIH, except insofar as it relates to coercion. Now, it doesn't relate to coercion particularly. Orthopedic surgeons don't coerce anyone to have a, their ankle set. If you break your ankle, you can go home and have it broken for the rest of your life. Nobody will bother you. Nobody will come and, and bother you. My name's uh, Marion Clark, and uh, I'm a user involvement uh, coordinator here at the, the centre. And uh, the, first, the first thing I have to say is really a comment, but I think they're both connected with the idea of democracy and furthering uh, democracy in reality. And I think the first thing I would say is that um, I mean, I'm just really happy to be sitting in this the centre because, for me, it's... Uh, it's actually a, a very concrete example of uh, a, a, an important advance that has been made in the whole question of um, dealing with mental distress, mental, mental health. And um, I think the, the, the reason for that is that um, the resources have been put here for uh, mental health service users and and their carers to be part of a project where they have equal status with other perspectives. And I think that is a singularly important thing to happen. And uh, I'm also very happy to be uh, sitting not just here, but in other places I've been to since I got uh, involved in the whole question of uh, the uh, user perspectives being very important, is uh, I have met an awful lot of uh, people who are uh, the allies of, of those who, for one reason or another, come into contact with mental health service. Oh, excuse me, and experience some form of distress. So I think um, that's also a really important thing because just as I would be, you know, very happy if I broke my leg or something, um, I'd be very happy to be looked after by somebody who was very good at it and felt inspired to spend their lives looking after other people. And I think it's the same with people who feel inspired to. Um, spend their lives, uh, you know, helping people who have mental and emotional distress. So, you know, I, I think that's an important thing to be said. I think um, the other thing is, the, the other thing is really is a question, and it's about why do you, um, from what I've heard you talk, talking, is, is that you, you refer to philosophers and writers about, um, about policy, um, and people like John Locke and so on, who really come, as far as I understand it, they come from the time of the development of capitalism. And, you don't, and there have been other writers on the state who are more modern and who have uh, developed their writings on the basis of um, women becoming enfranchised, the end of slavery, uh, the working class becoming a bigger force in politics and in, in society. And I think, um, to me, this is very much tied up with the furtherance of democracy. And I have to say, as um, my grandmother, um, and I come from the working class, and I think a lot of people would possibly back me up on this, is that we wouldn't touch charity with a barge pole. You know, that is what a lot of people feel about uh, the whole question of charity. And um, my grandmother died in absolute 
complete agony of, with stomach cancer because there was no there was no health service, there was no uh, NHS that um, that could actually help her, and there was nobody locally who had who were giving the resources for that to happen. So I think there was a whole area there. So um, I, I'm I think that's that's my question really is how. How is it that um, you take these references from a time in history which is really quite far back? It had, that's a very important point. Uh, let me first ask a question. I mean, let's assume, let's suppose that uh, your uh, grandmother would have been uh, in London, would have been within transportable distance to a hospital, a city hospital, a cherry, whatever it is. That hospital would have been called a university hospital, yeah. and uh, someone would put her in a in a in a car uh, and taken her there and left her at the doorstep, saying she's very sick. Uh, she, what would have happened to her? Wouldn't she, wouldn't she have been taken care of? Yes. I mean, it seemed to me that this was a clientele of so-called teaching hospitals, that people who were poor and who needed public care were needed by the medical schools to teach doctors. So this, there was a, a place for charity patients in, in those days. Yes. So, so in part, this was the problem of geography, that she was she, inaccessible to, care, to proper care. Now, having said that, it should be quite clear from what I have said and because it's common sense that the state, after all, the modern state, is the most powerful entity that we have. And therefore, it can also do a lot of good. Well, that goes without saying. And it's often been compared, George Washington compared it to a, a dangerous master. The state is a dangerous master because it's like fire. It can warm you and it can burn down your house. That's George Washington. Now, as far as capitalism, I have no hesitation of defending capitalism in the sense in which, and I have, by the way, I could have quoted contemporary current figures like Friedrich Hayek or Ludwig von Mises. I mean, there's a long line of people from Locke and, uh, you know, to the moderns. I mean, this, this idea of capitalism is, is it's fundamental to mankind that Locke and these people didn't invent it. I mean, it goes back to biblical times that, you know, you know to, to the old image, after all, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone, anyone but in, in certainly in the Judeo-Christian religions, God is a kind of a super capitalist. He owns everything. He created everything. This is very pertinent to killing. You don't have a right to kill anyone or yourself because it's, proper, it's God's property. And in Judaism, actually killing yourself is a worse offense than killing someone else. So this is, this is I think, inherent in human nature ownership, which is what capitalism is. And as far as you rising from poverty, uh, I hope uh, you, you, you must agree with me that I could cite much more dramatic examples occurring in America. America has been, during capitalism, the land of the greatest unbelievable advancement of people from nothing to billionaires and back again. And that's another American saying. From wrecks to riches and back again in three generations. From wrecks to riches and back again in three generations. That's freedom. Freedom is the most expensive thing in the world. That's why it's called golden handcuffs when to sell out to an organization, when to sell out to Scientology or to psychiatry or to medicine. Doesn't matter to whom, when you no longer maintain your own integrity and then you sell out. To that extent, you curtail your freedom. So this is not, a, I mean, again, your premise is that under some, that the more socialism you have, the more opportunities gives to poor people. That has not been the historical experience in the last hundred years. So at least as I see it, that's not been the historical experience because there has been even more opportunity in capitalist countries. So-called capitalist, I mean, there is no capitalist country anymore. 
I mean, I don't have to reiterate that, that this is like your point about coercion and psychiatry. After all, when you pay taxes 45, 50, 60 percent of your income, that's not capitalism, as was pointed out. If, when there was feudalism, the feudal slave only had to pay 30 percent of the, <laughs> that was a maximum rate of the um, agricultural product. So this is, so we now accept that uh, we, we are, it's all socialism, the only question is in what way? What kind of services does the state provide? Now should the state pro provide, uh, let's take your example because you are nice and thin, should it take your tax money, billions, to tell people not to eat too much so they don't become too fat? Is that a legitimate function of the state? Now you don't have to answer it, but this is the kind of question that you'd have to ask yourself when you get into this frame of mind about what should the state do? Because the problem with the state is who gets a control of it? And that's called voting. And that's certainly not, nothing equal, nothing particularly democratic about it. That becomes power politics. So that becomes, has its own tremendous dangers, in a, especially in a large pluralistic society. I mean, you see, I mean, who gets elected in America? I mean, there's already a sieve as to who can, who can run for it. It's, it's, it's very, you know, it's not very pretty. It's not very pretty. My name's Liz Offen and I'm a clinical psychologist working for South Birmingham Primary Care Trust, which is, which is NHS. And I was interested in what you, well, in your thinking around the state coercion and social control. And I think psychologists and other mental health workers sometimes get off quite lightly in comparison to psychiatry. But with the extension of psychiatric powers under the new Mental Health Act to mental health workers such, such as psychologists, I'm wondering whether there's any therapeutic role <coughs> then left for mental health workers, if indeed there, there was any in the, in the first place, as they're clearly employees of the state. And, and as such, are exerting social control in an increasing fashion because of the fact that they are em employed in that way. Your question, I take it, is similar to the gentleman's question about coercion vitiating the, the therapeutic, <coughs> negating, precluding it. I don't know. I think you're, <coughs> excuse me, your answer to the question is probably as good as mine or better. Uh, that, that depends, again, on, on the situation and the interaction and what, uh, what the purpose of the help seeking is. I think even within this coercive, potentially coercive framework, there is possibility of helping. By the way, earlier, I was, uh, you know, this is in my mind because I didn't get around to saying this. Earlier, you asked about you know, what can one do to help people. Well, you ought to know that, you know, not only, I mean, I didn't make my living from getting money from Scientology. I made money by practicing psychotherapy. I had, in addition to my university position, a private part-time practice, which was called psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. Now, I never called it that. Because I was already, I already had something of a reputation by the time I got to Syracuse, which was 51 years ago. Uh, and I identified myself from the word go to patients, potential patients especially, that I am selling, listening, and talking. This is a service I give, which is totally confidential. Totally. No suicide prevention, no nothing. And I had a flourishing practice. Lar relatively largely made up of psychiatrists who commuted long distances. Because this is a service which is essentially a religious service, going back, a human service, for which there is an enormous need in modern society because nobody can talk to anybody and nobody listens. Nobody listens because nobody, because this, if you are going to do this, obviously I needed to make a living too, and you are selling your time. In a way, I always thought of it as high-priced carpentry or, or garage mechanic. And I did whatever the client wanted. You know, what do you fix? Well, depending on whether the muffler is bad 
Or the tires are bad or something else. I mean, whatever sort of problem the patient had, assuming I could address that problem. It was highly selective because nine cases out of 10, people would come with problems. And very often, I did this selection on the telephone, basically, because very often a person would call and say, doctor, I have to see you. I want to see you. And I would on the telephone say, this was typically a man, say, well, Mr. Jones, why do you want to see me? And so the answer might be, because my wife says, if I don't see a psychiatrist, she'll divorce me. And I would say, thank you. I would, uh, th if that's the case, then I would rather not see you. I hope that makes sense to you. OK. Now, sometimes the person would say, I understand, but I would like to see you anyway. Then I might see that person one or two sessions, three sessions. And then in the second or third session, he might say, but would you see my wife too? And I said, well, you, you know, I explained that to you. He says, well, come I'm not seeing anybody else. <laughs> I'll be happy to see you again. But you see, this is, this is a way of helping people. And this builds on psychoanalysis. This is essential. But this is one particular way of doing it. Some people see families. That also works. Some people see couples. That can also work. See, in some ways, this is the beauty of capitalism. Because whether it works or not is defined by the buyer. If the buyer is willing to buy more of it, then by definition, it works. Now, again, this is an overstatement. But this is, you know, this is no different than going to a department store where you get some satisfactory service and you go back to that place again. You know, they sold you the kind of coat or shoes that you want. So you buy another one. Because there is. There is no definition here. It's not like medicine. See, in medicine, the, the joke that the operation was a success, but the patient died, makes sense, scientific sense, you know, properly understood. But in mental health, I don't know what sense that would make. Because what is a proper ending of it? Again, let's take the, the common sense variety of it. It could end, let's assume, the problem is a marital problem. It could end in a better marriage, or it could end in a divorce. Now, which is better? Which is, which is the right ending? Now, similarly, it could end in a better life, or it could end in a suicide, in the worst kind of case. Who is to see which is? It's, in that extent, it's open-ended, and it's totally, it is a, a, a Therapy for self-determination and freedom to increase a person. I wrote a book about that too a long time ago. If it has a purpose, the purpose of it is, is to give the client more sense of self-determination than he or she had before they came. Because a typical symptom is one of constraint. You know, well, typically, a phobia. I can't go into an elevator. You know, I can't leave my wife. I would like to do X, but can't do it. I would like to stop smoking. And I can tell you that this system, with a proper client, works very, very well. It's not that hard to help to cure people. You know, I use the word cure uh, metaphorically. I did just want to make one point, really, uh, thinking about capitalism and you know how useful that is, really, in that discussion. Because as I understand it, and it's just something I've read, but in the original constitution of the United States, they were careful to limit the power of corporations because they, they understood that, that that potentially was undermining for democracy. And at some point in the history of the United States, that got overturned so that the corporations have enormous power and, and they've become now multinational entities that are bigger than some states and, um, and th they um, exert enormous power over governments and, and for instance I think on uh, the drug companies I've read again that they have like 300 full-time lobbyists working in Washington to convince the politicians that they should be passing laws which favor drug companies. And I think all that undermines uh, democracy and, and to me I, I think this the, the free market is a, that there's a, there's a problem there really because if society is run by people who want us to buy things then that's very limiting on what we are as human beings and if, if I can just kind of finish off my thought and then, then I'll hand it over but I, I feel um, that 
I was a, before I became a, a mental patient and was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, I was a philosophy student and I kind of studied a bit of the philosophy of ideas. And to me, it seems that we're at a very early stage of what it is to be thinking humans, really, what it is to have a mind at all. I don't think we've really grasped it fully, you know, and I think we're, we're very young in that sense. So I feel quite hopeful that you know, what the future might hold. But I do think we have to break out of this, what, what the, we're held by in the consumer society. So that was my kind of final thought. Uh, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I have a lot of comments on that, but I'll make it brief. I really didn't come to sell my books, but I have to mention uh, some of them. Uh, because this issue that you bring up is very obvious and is really uppermost in, in many ways in the public discourse and dialogue of newspapers and magazines. And that is the connection between drug companies, their influence, their connection to the government, and generally uh, what was actually a general, a general uh, electric slow, I think general electric uh, slogan, better living through chemistry, that has become a kind of a, an ironic slogan also, that we take a pill for everything. Now, it's more than 40 years ago that I have been, I mean, it's as though I'm talking to myself when I, when I see and, and hear you. I have been preoccupied by this phenomenon uh, because in a way it goes back to prohibition. This is something very American, although it has spread worldwide. Not quite worldwide, but certainly to the Western, Western Europe. We don't live in a democracy. I sort of let me answer by starting at the end. We say we live in a democracy. No more. We used to live, up until modern age, in theocracies. Then we in the West developed democracies. Now, at least for the last 50 years, approximately, in America, it's quite clear that we not, do not live in a democracy. We live in what I have called, and this is one of the neologisms, I have coined several. Some of them have actually entered the English dictionary, of which I am very proud. We live in a pharmacracy, in a state which is the same as a theocracy, except instead of a church and state union, we have a medicine, pharmacology, drug union with the state. On the one hand, illustrated by the drug pushing by the state, the drugging of children involuntarily, and the war on drugs. The war on drugs, which were a part of American birthright. You could buy all the heroin you wanted from C.S. Roebuck, that's a famous catalog store up until 1906. There were no drug laws whatever, except against Chinese. The, the, the China, Chinese could not buy opium. That was the first modern racial and drug and labor law. That, that uh, speaking of socialism, that uh, law was stimulated by what became the American Federation of Labor, or by, by labor union, by early American labor unions, <coughs> because on the West Coast, in San Francisco, the Chinese came. There were a lot of Chinese, and they opened laundries, and worked on the railroad, and worked for you know, much less than the Americans would have. So this was, a, this was an early labor problem in that area. And the cult, the, the American cult became that they can do this because they don't have to eat their song out on opium. Total lie. But this was very popular. And it, introduced the Chinese Exclusion Act. See, this is inter intimately tied to politics and to this anti-opium law. But then there was no law until 1906 at all regulating medicine, prescriptions, or drugs. That was the age of the, uh, what was it called? The, the, what was the name of these drugs, which were essentially alcohol and uh, uh, Medicine is the second word. I can't think of the proper word. It will come to me. Patent, patent medicines. 
that, that was your patent medicines. Because your patent laws were older. So you could make up your patent medicine depending on how much, how much alcohol. And then typically, they contained alcohol, opium, and perhaps some uh, uh, cocaine. But typically, uh, which was laudanum, which was opium and, and alcohol. That was the concoction which Thomas Seidenham, the most famous physician in the world in the 17th century, English physician, said if there was no laudanum, doctors should go out of practice. Because all they can do really is give laudanum, which was this fantastic tranquilizer. Opium is much less harmful, as far as anyone knows. It's been studied for a long time than any of the modern psychiatric drugs. Uh, so what we have is a pharmacracy. So of course. But this is a specific situation. And to show you how relevant this is what you just said, that after all, corporations generally are still restrained, though not in the way in which it was originally intended, but by so-called antitrust laws, which is now happening to Microsoft. You can read it in the paper, this morning's paper. European court, you know, this is now also European court. So antitrust laws do work in this capitalist system. But of course, they don't work if the government and this particular interest group are in the same bed. They also don't work with Blackstone Group, or whatever it's called, or Halliburton, if they supply armaments for a particular purpose. Then this is a make-believe capitalism. You, can't, you and I can't go into the business of making tanks. I mean, it's, we are precluded. It's not like making some ordinary product. So there are these, but this again illustrates the power of the state, the power of ideas, and of course the power of money. That goes without saying. And I don't think there is anything that anybody can dream up to, to do more than intelligently counteract them, which is what the Founding Fathers tried to do, which is what the Magna Carta tried to do. I mean, this is a continuous, continuous struggle. What's the Magna Carta about? That was not democracy. That was a, the nobles against the king. So it was what, at least at one level. But you see, it opened the floodgate. And that floodgate is still open. So I, I am quite optimistic. <laughs>